Today, I'm both pleased and proud to offer my seventh course from Pluralsight and my first one on React. For 10 years now, I've been focused on single-page JavaScript apps that work really well with back-end servers. I continue to believe that for anyone building enterprise-quality apps, the single-page app, also known as SPAs, are the way to go. If you really think about it, it makes total sense. Why is that? It's because you can write your code in a natural way. You don't have a ridiculous HTML DOM backend server interaction around your UI events that make programming a nightmare. No crazy postback semantics to manage around like in other web programming languages. So why Facebook React? Because simply it's the best JavaScript single page app library out there. Personally, I know I'll get some flack for this. I love JavaScript, and especially the new features, including things like Lambda, spread operators, and promises. Unlike other spas, React fits like a glove to these new features, and it just feels second nature to programming JavaScript. The learning curve is super friendly, refactoring is easy, and productivity for me is really high. My course, React and ASP.NET Core, is just over three hours, and can be viewed with a Pluralsight subscription. But if you don't have a Pluralsight account, check out the next few minutes where I've included a couple clips teaching how to access REST services, a little bit of debugging with Redux, and integrating with ASP.NET Core in the Create React App templating system. Of course, don't forget that I'm an independent consultant also, and if you need help with projects or custom videos for your company that better serve your needs than a generic training video, I can help with that also. Reach out to me at my website, peterkellner.net, click on the contact page, and I'll get back to you. Okay, let's start with a few sample clips. In this clip, you will learn how to retrieve speaker data from a REST server endpoint using Redux to manage the data instead of directly accessing component state as we did in the previous clip. That is, we called axios.get directly in component did mount and then on the axios.get success method, or what axios called dot then, we directly updated the component state, which caused the speaker component to re-render with the new state. In this clip, we will create a new Redux action and reducer to do the same thing. In the clip directly following this, you will learn how to dispatch actions inside components, specifically our speaker component, that will cause the component to re-render with the updated data. Adding React Redux and then updating the component to be able to dispatch Redux actions will give us the same functionality as we have now in component did mount. If you've not used React Redux before, hang on and try and follow along with what I'm doing. I'll try not to leave anything out, but you might find it helpful to put some time into learning React Redux. It takes a little getting used to. My opinion is it's as worth the investment. As you will see in a later module, it would be really hard to do server-side rendering without React Redux, so that's one reason I'm including it in this course and this module. Okay, so let's get down to some coding and convert what we've previously done to a pure Redux solution. As I just said, you could think of React Redux as kind of a global state manager for your React web app. To that end, let's create a separate directory tree called Redux and put it at the base of our React project. All React's Redux websites require a site-wide, or as I call it, a global Redux store. Later, you will learn how any component in our web app can access this store, but for now, let's just create the store. A common method you'll see for creating the Redux store is a method named configure store. Let's just make that now in our Redux directory and copy in literally a one-line method call that will create the store, and then I'll explain it. First though, we're going to install a few node packages to support our Redux implementation. In the terminal here, I'm installing the node packages Redux, React Redux, Redux Axios Middleware, React Router Redux, and React Thunk. So looking at our configure store method, you'll notice that it takes one parameter as input, and that parameter is the initial state of the store. Keep in mind that the whole purpose of Redux is to manage a global state for us, so having this parameter allows us to start our app in a given state. Typically, and by default if we don't pass anything in, the state is just an empty object. I'm hoping that you might be thinking to yourself that this state might be useful when we later talk about server rendering. 
It most definitely is, but let me build this one step at a time and we'll eventually get there. The one line of code basically returns our created store by calling the Redux method create store. The method takes a few parameters. First, we pass in the reducers. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute, but basically reducers do one and only one thing. They take an incoming state and return a new state. The second parameter is the passed in initial state. The third parameter is a little tricky. It basically adds a middleware to our reducer so that things like Axios, okay, Axios middleware in this case, can actually jump in and do things behind the scenes when reducers are processed. I won't go into much detail here, but what this apply middleware method does, which by the way is part of Redux, is it accepts a thunk and accepts the middleware itself that we will be using. You could think of a thunk as a special JavaScript language enhancement that lets functions be passed around. And the Axios middleware is a nice custom enhancement to Redux that gives our REST processing really cool superpowers. Okay, I admit that I brushed over that pretty quickly, but the good news is we only had to create this once and then you don't need to come back to the store again. Now, let's move on to creating an action and reducer for retrieving data in our speaker component. Let me briefly explain a Redux action again. It's basically a name function that you call to dispatch it from any place in our React web app. You could think of dispatching it similar to how you might fire an event or even make a global method call of sorts. Personally, I think dispatch is a good way to refer to what you're doing because you actually do dispatch the action method. Back to code. Let's create a new directory in our Redux folder called actions. And in that directory, let me paste in an action method that dispatches an action of type speaker load. The big picture with actions is that all an action does is it returns an object that has a type, which speaker load is in this case, and a payload, which can be anything. Keep in mind though, that when I talk about Redux middleware, I said that the middleware can insert functionality inside the action reducer pipeline. As we will see in a moment, our reducer that is processed after this action is processed will have extra things populated on the action's payload that the reducer can work with. The short story is that if you have middleware, you likely have conventions you need to follow, like I have here, where the payload is an object with an attribute request that in turn has an attribute URL, which is where Axios middleware will get data from. We are looking at the speaker component we built a few clips ago before Redux. Component did mount essentially does all the work. It uses Axios directly to get the server data. Then when the data returns, it updates the component state, causing the speaker component to re-render and the speaker data to display. Time to bring in Redux. Remember I said we are going to remove the dependency from Axios in the component. Well, let's do that first by getting rid of the Axios import one win right out of the box. Remember also I said that somehow we need to get our speakers component to reference the Redux store. The syntax is a little tricky, but essentially we do it at the bottom of our file. What we have now is just simply export default speakers. Let me change that and explain what we've got now. What we are exporting now is essentially what gets returned from the connect method, which is part of React Redux and that method takes two parameters. The first is map state to props, which is a function we create in the speaker's component that gets passed in the new state and is designed for you to set new properties based on. The second parameter is the method call or the named action function we talked about earlier. In this case, speakers fetch data, which dispatches our speakers load action and whose reducer speaker load, speaker load success and speaker load fail update our global Redux state. The function that is returned from connect then executes passing in our speaker components. That is what essentially ties our Redux actions and reducers to this component. To bring this to life, there are two have to do's. First, we need to replace our Axios calls and our component did mount method to just a single call to speakers fetch data. Then we have to implement map states to props 
to take our reduced or new state data and set it to the component properties. That way, we never actually render state, just properties. Pasting in a complete map state to props function, you see I've done the work for us. Looking briefly at the speaker's reducer, you can see how we know what states map to properties. Remember, the reducer returns new state, and that new state data is what we are setting to the properties. Before we can run our new speakers component, there are a few bookkeeping things we need to do. First, we need to add some imports to the top of the speakers component to handle our new React Redux functionality. Then, instead of referencing state in a render method, we want to change that to render props, which we converted in our map state to props method we just talked about. Specifically, this dot states dot is loading becomes this dot props dot is loading, and this dot states dot app data becomes this dot props dot speakers. Finally, we never actually connected Redux to our components. To do that, we need to go into our base JavaScript file, client.js, add a reference to our configure store method so we can create our store. We also need to basically wrap our app with a React Redux tag, which we do by using the provider React component and passing in our declared store. We also, of course, have to reference the provider by importing it. Okay, so let's see what happens when we launch our React app. No surprise, it works exactly as it did before. We've completely removed Axios processing from our component and moved our REST and Axios processing into Redux. You might be wondering, where's the win for all this work we are doing to add Redux? Well, even without talking about server-side rendering, there are tons of benefits to using Redux. Just for starters, there are built-in debug tools that make viewing state changes when using Redux unbelievably easy and insightful for finding bugs. It also makes building enterprise apps that have lots of modules and data much easier to keep track of and reason about. Keeping track and reasoning about is hard to quantify, but the Redux debugging story is a no-brainer to want. In the next clip, you'll learn how to debug state changes when you have Redux as your state manager. I'm sure this will convince you to stick around and watch what else we can do with Redux as this module continues. Running ASP.NET Core and React together does not require having a node server in the picture. So far, we've been using the Webpack dev server to run and test our node app. The easiest way to take what we've been doing to production is to simply build a production version of our React app and then copy that to our www root directory of an ASP.NET Core project. Let me just do that now, step by step for you, and you'll know exactly what I mean. What we're looking at here is Visual Studio, and we'll use that to create our .NET web app with ASP.NET Core. First, we do File, New, Project in Visual Studio. Then we choose Web, ASP.NET, Core. We name it Web Core App. We navigate to the directory we want to put it in, making sure that's an empty directory. We add the middleware Use Static Files to support serving static files from www root. And we also need to add some support files so that index.html renders correctly. Then we go to the Create React App directory, that's my app. We run npm run build, which creates the production version of our node app. Then we copy all the files from the build directory into www root of our Visual Studio project. We launch with no debug, and it just works. At this point, all we have is basically a static web server that hosts files on www root. It's an ASP.NET Core web server, so technically this is an important step in making a React app work with ASP.NET Core. Later in this course, we will take a deeper dive into supporting REST services from our React app to our ASP.NET Core web server. Processing static files is quite simple. REST requires a little more thought. We will also talk about another way of integrating Core and React. 
we will talk about completely decoupling our React app from ASP.NET. We'll do that by having the React app running on its own node server and having it reach out to another domain for the REST services, both reading and updating data. As far as I'm concerned, that's the holy grail of web development when integrating two different technology stacks. Let them both run where they each run best. Bring them together where it makes the most sense. In this case, the domain boundaries. That is, ASP.NET will run on one URL and React will run from a Node.js server on another URL. More about this later in the course. Thank you.